Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ashley. Good afternoon, Luna. Good afternoon, Daniel. Good afternoon, Nikaya. Good afternoon, Jerry. Good afternoon, Jenna. Good afternoon, all caps, your gellers. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon, Alyssa. This, this is like shockingly consistent. Okay, good afternoon, Sam. I don't know why that sounded like a question mark. Wait, and it's totally perfect because yes, and also good afternoon, Ashley and Sam again, because you don't have black boxes. And good afternoon, anybody else who might be watching this for reasons that are like exciting but unclear to me um but very appreciated um okay wait yes so that's a blah, blah 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 so as a special treat today i might have a battery that might actually last us for a oh, you can hear me right sorry can everybody oh maybe not maybe. i can hear you Oh, okay, okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Okay, awesome, awesome. Oh, and thank you, Alyssa. And oh, by the way, that's closing a conversation. That is what. Oh, and thank you, Stephanie. And thank you, Yorgelis. That is closing a conversation for everybody right there. Okay, and if you can hear me, you can probably also hear the sounds of BKNY coming to you from Nostrand Avenue. Oh, yes, a mere four blocks from where I used to live. Um, for reasons that are totally unclear. Okay, well, they're clear, but uninteresting. Okay. Um, oh, wait, wait, more people here. Um, okay, okay. Okay. Um, so good afternoon again. Okay, and I do, but let me know. Okay, you can hear me, that's good, but you probably can also hear all the extra noise. Every Tuesday is a different choice that I'm making as to how to, uh, hello, Jennifer, awesome, good to see you. Hello, Jennifer. Um, uh, as you can see, every Tuesday I make a different choice as to how to do this in a way that minimizes spasticity and every decision has a downside. So basically I'm saying if there's a lot of noise pollution here that's bothering you guys, please let me know and I'll probably do nothing about it, but probably apologize a lot. Um, okay. But I'm, I'm assuming that when you could say you can hear me, that that means not only the audio, but that like you can actually understand me, hopefully over the background music, which actually, if I had to choose background music for this video, I probably would choose what I'm hearing in the back because it's nice, but not necessarily conducive to mathematical thinking. Okay, okay, okay. So here's the deal we're gonna get. We are gonna start actually, actually going over the second homework assignment, unbelievably. After like a month and five weeks of doing all this kind of like review and recollection and building and building all of which the homework one sort of asked us to do, whether we knew or not, we're gonna move to homework two. We're gonna start moving faster now. We're gonna start actually like seeing these differential equations in action. Um, um, and this particularly in homework three, we really do. Let me say that I'm fully caught up with you guys now. Like any one of you who did have the guts, and it was really guts, any one of you had the guts to actually attempt homework three, uh, particularly when you, which was a while ago when you attempted it, and we hadn't even finished question on homework. So it was like really rough. And it was, and I could see, I mean, it was a rough undertaking. But you guys, the people that tried it did really well and did something really authentic. And I think they're going to find it even easier if they look at it again now, now that we're moving. But anybody who did try homework three has gotten it back now and it's gotten a lot of points. Like even if you're going to see today that maybe there's clearer or easier ways to do it than you might have known at the time, like huge amount of points for very authentically trying. And a lot of people did make a lot of progress with it. I think for the rest of you, it's you, especially after today, you probably can make an attempt at homework three because you'll see, it'll not seem, it, it, it would seem crazy hard to me out of nowhere if I was still in the middle of homework one and I tried homework three. And that's why we've had extensions and that's why there's like nothing new to do for a while. But I think now after today, particularly, as we make our way through homework two, we're not gonna finish it, but we'll do enough of homework two. I think if you turn to homework three and look at it, you'll really, it will really not seem nearly as intimidating. In fact, it's practice once you get to a certain point. Okay, 
But again, so kudos to anybody who's tried it. You got it back if you tried it. You got a ton of points. Frankly, any one of you who did homework three, just to be clear, you might not have gotten all the points, but you got so many points that if I were you and there was anything to do, I would just move on. Like I'd be fine with it if I, you know, but if you want the extra points, you can go back and fix, you know, once you see what we do today. But anyway, the rest of you, I think you'll be ready to do homework three after today. Today, we're going to start going over homework two. I'm going to put it on the screen because I know it's, first of all, there are some people watching who don't know what I'm why I need my homework too. But also, I think it's been a long time since any of you looked at it. Any one of you who did homework too has gotten it back at this point. I think that's fair to say. And again, maybe you only did part of it, totally fair, totally reasonable. You still can get all the remaining points if you start going back and looking at it as we, okay, as we go through. I'm just gonna share the screen for a second though so you can see what we're talking about. So anybody can see what we're talking about. Um, oh, 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 and, and, sorry. And stop me anytime, as usual, of course. But the thing that's on the screen right now, like whatever, the title page, that you know, that is in effect what I think the conclusion was that we came to last time right, and the time before, except it looks a little different because it has Zs instead of Xs. I want to make a point about that. But basically what I think we are saying right now, what I think we have learned finally, and it's big, and it did take us a long time, but I think our takeaway from question nine of homework one, and I think our take away from the little bit of exploration of it last time is that if we ever encounter well yeah if we ever encounter that differential equation written in the middle of the page if we ever encounter it in any context in life math physics whatever if we see that equation written down then at least a solution that works so i'm making a mathematical point at the moment here if we see that math equation that differential equation a solution that works is the one written below it. What do I mean by that again? I mean, if we are told this information about the second derivative of some variable Z with respect to T, if, if there's some variable Z and we're told something about its second time derivative, but what we really wanna know is directly speaking, how does Z depend on time, right? Then a solution to that differential equation to that relationship above a function for z that actually works that satisfies the differential equation is the one written below okay that's a purely mathematical statement that i'm making again i'm sort of just trying to point out that when you're giving a differential equation and asked to solve it that means you're not looking for numbers you're looking for a function that meets the requirement of that differential equation you're okay and last thing i'm saying uh, you'll notice i've never written you might be saying, where did Z come from? Like everything we solved last week and the week before was all about X and T because we were specifically looking at a specific physics situation of a mass on a spring moving back and forth along an X axis. What I'm trying to point out right now, and, and, and so the physics that we were saying is essentially, oh, if something satisfies Hooke's law, well, I'll write that in a second. We, physically, what we were saying is if something can be described by Hooke's law, which, which is really what that differential equation is mathematically saying, that differential equation is a mathematical generalization, really, of Hooke's law. It's really just Hooke's law plugged into F net equals MA. Think about it. Um, so we're saying any physical situation that satisfies Hooke's law can be described by a cosine position function. If you want to predict where the thing is in time, cosine will work for anything that satisfies Hooke's law. That's the physical thing that we're saying. And why I changed the X's to Z's on purpose, like from now on often, you're gonna see me writing it with a Z. By Z, I just mean any generalized dependent variable. Like what I'm saying is, even though we got motivated to do all this math by a physics situation, there was nothing special once we landed on that differential equation. The differential equation didn't care or know that we specifically were picturing a coiled spring. It just knows the math relation. So I'm saying now whatever we figured out about X last week and the week before, or you know, last class and the class before, whatever we figured about X, it wasn't relying on any special property of the letter X. It was just what we figured out about things in that relation. So from here on, so it's true. We figured out a math thing that is just mathematically true now. And of course we'll apply always to that particular physical situation, but maybe, in fact, definitely will apply to any kind of physical situation that happens to be describable by that math. In other words, let's, like one big advantage we get from the math is we no longer have to be bogged down in thinking that it only is about positions on an X axis with a coiled piece of metal. Any variable, and this is a big hint for homework three, frankly, any 
dependent variable from here on it, any unknown quantity whose measurement depends on time in that way, in the way of that differential equation, is from now on solvable by a cosine function. That's what we're saying. So, so I'll just quickly. So by z, I mean any generalized, any dependent variable at all is what I mean by z. So let me just write my thing, and then we're going to move on. if you can actually read the red or maybe you only count it. But once again, I'm just trying to say the top thing is a differential equation. The bottom thing is a solution, meaning it's dependent variable direct uh, expressed direct as a direct function of independent variable. And this whole thing really is, this is the differential equation for um, uh, oscillation. Oh, for sure. For sure means for simple harmonic oscillation. Let me, I actually wanted to find that on the next page, uh, but to, um, yeah, let me just Uh, no problem. Thank you very much. Direct met. Totally get it. Totally. Thank you. I totally can relate. Okay. Um, I, I, so as I said, I want to go start going over homework too with everybody and I'm going to share the screen and, you know, put it up so we can see the questions in a minute. Um, but something, but I almost forgot to say this last time. I, th I think I did neglect to say this last time. Super important thing here. And even and even before I say this, I'm, so I'm going to go back to this page in one second. There's one other note I want to make on the first page, just to be as clear as I can possibly be. You probably already know this, all of you. Um, but this term right here, Z naught, okay? Now, again, you know, last week it was X naught. In other future classes, depending on, like, what we're talking about, it might be theta naught. Like, if we're talking about a pendulum going back and forth uh, and uh, back and forth through angular positions along some arc, then we might be talking about theta naught instead of 
X naught. If we're talking about electric field, as we will later, then we might be talking about E naught. Like, like the variable could be anything is ultimately what I'm getting at here. The reason we spend so much time on the math, honestly, is so that the physical situation that we are trying to study, we can ultimately generalize and extrapolate to lots and lots of other physical situations. Okay, so again, so now Z, I just mean as any dependent variable, right? I said that, so Z naught is the initial value for Z, right? If, for example, we were talking about X, then, then it'd be X naught, which means like 15 centimeters from the equilibrium position, you know, if we're talking about a mass going back and forth on the screen. So Z naught was the initial value of Z, right? But we spent a long time thinking about energy conservation and realizing that we do the energy conservation in any one of these situations, or particularly in a mass going back and forth on a spring, if your initial position, it means the position where you have zero velocity, where you were released from rest, if that's what we mean by initial position, then it turns out if you think through energy conservation, then that position is also necessarily gonna end up being, I mean, all other things being equal, that's gonna be the maximum displacement from equilibrium as well. Right, Z naught denotes initial Z, but all of our knowledge and all of this work that we're putting into this connotes, leads us to realize that whatever your initial position is, is also gonna be your maximum. That's two different ideas. It's not a triple equal sign, but they're both linked together in a situation like this. Therefore, this initial term, this initial position, we end up generally in this context calling amplitude and you've heard many, you know, you've all heard the term amplitude in many contexts, in other science classes, maybe even in sixth grade, what amplitude is like the top point on a cosine graph or something like that, or at the bottom point. And what does it really mean? Amplitude, it means maximum displacement from equilibrium. That's what amplitude means. So from now on, I'm gonna use that term and I'm gonna use it to refer to the Z naught or X naught or whatever naught. Like again, the naught specifically explicitly means initial, but if all of this, if this whole system is running, if we're talking about an oscillator here being governed by Hooke's law, then initial is gonna end up meaning as well maximum. So from now on, and, and the word for maximum in physics is amplitude, I mean, if that, as in amplify, right? Um, so, so I just wanna be absolutely explicit because I'm gonna make a point about this now, just labeling wise and vocabulary wise, like from here on in, and I know this sheet is getting messy, but just so we can be apt from now on, so we're on the same page like, like this, term right here we're going to call amplitude this is a mess um but amplitude which by which i mean maximum mac and maybe just write it in your own notes some way mac amplitude means maximum displacement from equilibrium okay now why did i just back up and make that definition because i want to give you a larger definition we've been talking about oscillation here like our mass on the spring that started this whole discussion was going back and forth back and forth oscillating i don't think that that didn't surprise anybody everybody understood that from the start it was doing something cyclical like over and over again making round trips cyclically notice the language by the way the damn thing excuse me the darn thing was just going straight back and forth along an x-axis but we have all these words that we use like round trip meaning there and back or cyclical there all all connoting circles even though there is no curve to be found here is because the thing is doing something over and over and over again cyclically or periodically okay when anything does that we call it oscillation even if it does it in a very jagged spazzy way like me saying the same thing over and over and over that's oscillation if i walk there and walk back and walk back even if i do it in a crazy way or a fan that goes back and forth, that's oscillation in general but from here on in the kind of situation I'm talking about here is very strict, not just any kind of oscillation, but strict oscillation that's like governed by Hooke's law that doesn't have any tricks up its sleeve, say no friction and so like that. Anything that goes back and forth according to this deferential equation and which has this solution, from here on we're gonna call harmonic oscillation. Now, it's still simple, meaning again, no tricks up our sleeve. Uh, but but it's but harmonic is a very special kind of oscillation that everything we're talking about here will be. And what do I specifically mean by harmonic? Well, on the one hand, I mean, and again, this applies to what we've been saying and what we're going to say. By harmonic, so harmonic is like a subset of oscillation. All harmonic oscillations are oscillations, but not all, all oscillations are harmonic oscillations. What do I really mean by harmonic? Well, first, on an intuitive level, on the basic level of what you'd expect, I do mean something that goes back and forth in a kind of regular periodic way. 
Like it doesn't just periodically go there and go back. It has like a constant period. Like it always takes three seconds to go there and come back, or it always takes seven seconds to go there and come back. Oh, right. That, that's what I, on an intuitive level by harmonic, what I really mean is that uh, experimentally constant period, or as we realized last time, mathematically, I really mean constant angular frequency. Remember that the big one big takeaway of last time is that angular frequency standard angular frequency measured in radians per second, standard frequency measured in cycles per second or Hertz and period measured in seconds per cycles are three interchangeable ways of describing the exact same information. If you know one, you automatically know the other two. They are literally equivalent, all three, angular frequency, standard frequency and period. They're all conveying the same information. If you know one, you automatically know the other two. So much so that you, one could even ask, why do we need all three then? Why don't we just have one? Because one is the most explicitly directly emergent from the math, that's angular frequency. The math will spit out things in radians per second. And, and that is the most, because we're taking all the math we know about circles and imposing them on cycles. So the math leads us to think in terms of radians and leads us to always think in terms of two pi's. There's two pi radians per every cycle, right? But on the other hand, period, how many seconds per cycle is for all of us, for all of us, the most intuitive, like, 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 like picturable in our minds and the most directly measurable in the lab. Like we all can most easily picture and, 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 and relate to, oh, this takes four seconds to go there and back. None of us, no matter how mathematical we are, well, I probably shouldn't say that, but I don't think any of us is trying to get you to believe that when we see something go there and back, we automatically think, oh, that's doing six pi radians per second. Like, no, it takes a moment to, and, and it's very hard to measure. You can't measure pi in the lab. So radians per second is what comes out of the math. Seconds per cycle is what comes out of the lab, but they're equivalent information ultimately. So here's what I'm saying now to everybody. Number one, by harmonic, I mean that the angular frequency, like it's a more proper way to talk about it now. I mean, the angular frequency of the oscillator is a constant, like which we call it omega, right? As long as there is an omega that's not changing in time, then we call it harmonic, but even deeper than that. And this is really the thing from last time. And we'll see it again in the homework. Remember, and well, I'll even say. This sheet that I just wrote down, honestly, it's like three sentences and it's the summary of everything we've been saying for like the last three days. I mean, it's actually a lot of information right there, but what we were saying in the last few days is if you've got Hooke's law governing, so, oh, sorry, if you've got Hooke's law governing uh, the position of a mass on a spring, going back and forth, back and forth, then, then the position at any given moment is a cosinusoidal function of time, right? And the angular frequency of that cosinusoidal function is square root of k over m, right? That's what we've been saying. I'm not saying that's new, but I'm saying you really do want to get used to that. But here's what's so heavy, what's so, and it really is, what's so physically fascinating about this last bit, where we found that by omega, we mean square root of k over m, right? Which on the one hand could just mean, oh, omega was just a placeholder, it's just a funny Greek letter we just used to figure out what is, what is the rate per, in radians per second that must, go right before the T in the cosine function to make the units work out. Like, oh, it turns out it's square root of K over M. But what this really means physically, what we really found out when we saw for omega and found that it's equal to the square root of K over M, what that means.
Actually, I'm not on the page. I'm not on the page. All right. I know I'm making it. I know I want to get to homework too. I apologize. I know I, I, I need to get to homework too, but it's actually shocked. Oh, 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 oh. Wait, let me see this. Oh, oh. Okay, wait. So let me back up for one second to Sam's good question in the chat. So, so in the chat, Sam is saying, I don't really get why Z or X naught or whatever naught has to be the maximum displacement. She's saying, why does the initial displacement have to be the maximum displacement? Great question. And I am assuming a couple of things when I say that it does. I mean, I'm not saying in life it always has to be. I'm saying, let's back up for a second. Whatever, whatever we called X naught, so great question. Totally points, points, points. Again, the question is if anybody didn't hear it or doesn't see a chat, the question is, I'm making, I'm saying, I'm saying for a harmonic oscillator, for an oscillator of this type, for an oscillator that obeys Hooke's law, which we are assuming, I'm saying the initial displacement from equilibrium ha ultimately be becomes or is the maximum displacement for equilibrium. And that's just enough of a statement. Like I'm making a big point of that statement. So it's totally reasonable to say, wait, I guess if that's, I mean, if he has to say it four times, it can't be self-evident. So why is it true at all? Right. Good question. So it's true, assuming a couple of things that I'm assuming, and those assumptions become the reasons. One thing I'm assuming that when I say X naught, when I say, for example, that our original mass that we looked at on our original spring that was going back and forth, when we originally said it is initially at 15 centimeters from equilibrium, like when we said X naught equals uh, 0.15 meters, what did we mean by initially? Like we didn't mean initially like the big bang or the garden of Eden. We didn't mean, we meant t equals zero, but what does t equals zero mean? It doesn't mean the beginning of all time. First of all, it means where we start our stopwatch, where we start paying attention, but, but that's a big, but even more to the point, and we did say this then, but I should be saying it more clearly now. What we really meant was that's where the mass was held at rest and then released from. In other words, e e even if the thing had been going, like you could imagine, like it's actually hard to do an experiment that way. It's actually hard to set everything up and like start your stopwatch at the very moment that you release the mass. But another way to imagine the same idea is imagine the mass is going back and forth for a while. It's going back and forth and back and forth for a while. And you walk in and you wait until the mass is all the way at a stopping point, at a point of V instantaneous equals zero. And you start your stopwatch then. Okay, because that's really what we're saying. When we say it's initial, what we really mean is that's a place where it had no velocity. Like easiest to picture in some ways, oh yes, because that's where we released it from. But it doesn't matter if that was actually the release point. What matters, what makes it X naught, what I should be saying as explicitly as possible is the point where V instantaneous is zero. If that, so I'm assuming that, and I'm also assuming Hooke's law and nothing else going on, therefore energy Conserve like the only force on this thing is a spring force, which is a conservative force. So, if by initial place we mean place where the thing is at rest, has no velocity, and if we believe energy is conserved, then if you think about it, the place where it's at rest is a place of zero kinetic energy. Therefore, all of its energy has to be potential there. So, that's the total bundle of energy it has at that point. Like it has a certain amount of energy, kinetic plus potential, but all of it is potential now. So now it starts moving, it starts losing potential energy, gaining kinetic energy, da, 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 keeps going. It's going to go until all of its kinetic energy is converted all into potential energy. And the total amount of potential energy it's going to convert to has to be the same as it ever is. Like it never can gain or lose energy. So the most potential energy it can ever have is the amount that it ever had when it had zero speed. In other words, everything in an energy conserver is, remember, a spot speed trade-off. If you name the spot, I can name the speed. Or if you name the speed, I can name the spot. So the the spot where, so what am I trying to say? So the place where this is going to have maximum spot is always going to be where it has minimum speed. And minimum speed is what we're calling X naught. So wherever it started, as long as it started from rest, that's the farthest it can ever get. I I think it was a really good question, but I hope my answer was clear. Maybe Sam. so. Like in the in the spring, uh, question from homework one, it's starting at t equals zero at fifteen centimeters. So that's where you start because when you let it go, the farthest it's going to go from equilibrium, whether negative or positive, it's always going to be that. Would that be the amplitude then? You were saying yeah, exactly it would be fifteen right. centimeters. Exactly. All right, I think that makes sense. Then, actually, thank you. 
Cool, awesome. And that's close. She just got pulling score, closing the conversational path. But yes, yeah, awesome, awesome. Okay, exactly. And again, that's worth, yeah, so cool. All right, cool. Very good question. And yes, now, so, so from here on in, now, why? Why does Sam care? Why do I care? Why does anybody care? I don't know. Well, I care because from now on, if by amplitude, I mean maximum displacement, check this out. I mean, this is really weird and it's really surprising. We're crunching all this math, all this math. And like, I want to bring it back to physics, of course. There is, in all this math, there's a hidden physical conclusion. Notice when we solve for omega last Tuesday or and Thursday, whatever, we solve for omega, we got as a square root of K over M. There's a K term in there. There's an M term in there. What there isn't is an X naught term. There's no, like, notice our expression for omega depends on stuff, but it doesn't, and it depends on constants, but it doesn't depend on the constant known as X naught. What does that mean? That means that evidently the initial spot that I started to spring on, the initial displacement, ultimately the maximum displacement, doesn't in any way affect the rate at which this thing goes back and forth. What this mean now that what this means, at least about this particular example, but if this math is all true, then it's going to be true for all examples. What that means is that I just lost my board. Hold on. Okay. What this means is Oh, sorry, sorry, hold on. Oh, did I just lose my board? Hold on, sorry, I just lost. I, hold on. My, is there a strange sound coming? Okay. Um, Okay, this is actually a very heavy point that I'm making right now. I mean, I, mean, I think this is a very, this is a big point here. And this is the definition, this is harmonic. Everything I'm saying right now is about our mass spring system 
but it's about any system that obeys this math and any system that obeys this math we're ultimately going to call harmonic that that okay so if nothing else this is vocabulary i suppose but but here's the interesting feature of harmonic harmonic does mean regular oscillation like like reliable constant but it's more than constant it's i i couldn't that's true i totally couldn't. um i wouldn't even try why would i try um uh um for something to be okay okay um what i guess you heard that okay what 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 um 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 um, um what means harmonic is not just constant it's deeper than that okay first of all when i say harmonic i do mean constant tick tock rate i mean like they're back they're back at a regular rate like a metronome okay i do mean that but it's but it goes deeper than that or, or, or the true nature of a metronome goes deeper, deeper than that because look what we're saying here th there's many constants in the world k and chem are constant but they're a particular kind of constant they are a constant called a parameter they are constant measurable physical properties of our system meaning we take the ingredients of our system like we take the spring we take the mass we measure how much ma like how many kilograms the mass is in our case it was 0.3 kilograms we measure the stiffness of the spring in our case it was 200 newtons per meter and then we start assembling them together and putting it together and like doing an experiment right those numbers 200 and 0.3 are parameters in the sense that they describe the ingredients of our system physical properties measurable properties they are and they're not going to change no matter how we set up the system okay they are not part they're not conditions they are not configurations they are not well they're not those they're not conditions or configurations they are not set up numbers they are ingredient numbers technically called parameters now we set up the system we put our mass on our spring, we put the spring on the table, and then we pull the mass back to a certain spot. In our case, happens to be 15 centimeters from equilibrium. That spot we call X naught, we're now calling it the amplitude. Now that is a setup. That's not an ingredient of the system, right? That's a choice. We could set it up to 15 centimeters, or we could set, we could pull it out to 30 centimeters, or like it's constant, it will be a constant once the system gets going. But it might not be your constant, even if you use the same ingredients. Like I couldn't know what, for example, this amplitude, this 15 centimeter thing, I couldn't know that that was going to be the amplitude just by looking at the mass and the spring on the table or just by buying them from the store, right? So the 15 centimeters, the amplitude is called a condition or configuration. It, it's going to be constant, but it's constant because of the way I set up, the way I chose to set up the system, whereas the parameters are, they're not a choice. They are intrinsic to the ingredients of the system. Now, why is all this interesting? Maybe it's not, except this. Apparently, if omega, if the math says that omega only depends on K and M, it only depends on parameters, the omega is determined by parameters. It is not determined by conditions. That means this thing is going to, I pull this thing out to 15 centimeters and it's going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, like say every two seconds or whatever we found. I don't remember, right? Or it's, yeah, I don't remember, but the, I think it was, why do I care? I, I want, it doesn't matter. Like it's going back and forth like every two seconds, like tick tock, tick tock, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, right? It's doing that when I pulled it out to 15 centimeters and the farthest it's ever going is 15 centimeters. According to this map, even if I stop the whole thing and start all over again and pull it out to a much farther place of like 45 centimeters, right? So even if I pull it all the way out to 45 centimeters where it has a much farther route to travel. And now, and according to the Sam question, remember if I pull it out to 45 centimeters now to start, apparently it's always going to make it to 45 centimeters. Like that's its new maximum, right? If I started at 45, it's going to go all the way across to negative 45, all the way back to positive 45 and on, on forever, right? Yeah, I'm going to totally look at that. I think the answer is yes to Sam's thing. I'm going to totally look at it. I only see part of the chat for a sec. I'm going to look at it for one second, but let me just like spit this out of my chest. I, I need a therapist to get this off my chest. Like, cause this is really a huge point. And it's surprise. Like, and please do listen to it, even if you think you know it's because I find it surprising. I'm saying if I pull this, and it probably is what Sam's saying, but we'll find out in a minute. If I pull this mass all the way to 45 now, so the darn thing is going to go much farther, much farther, like much bigger swings, right? Evidently, the amount of time it's going to take will still be the exact same as for the 15 meter, 15 centimeter one. Like, evidently, the angular frequency 
the square root of k over m. It has nothing to do with whether I pulled it out to 15 or to 45. Evidently, the rate of oscillation, whether you want to call it the angular frequency or the period, whatever's easier for you to relate to, but the rate, the rapidity, the time cycle of going back and forth and going back and forth, evidently that has nothing to do with how much space I ask this thing to undergo. It doesn't matter how far it has to travel, it's still gonna travel it in the exact same amount of time. It doesn't matter how you set this thing up. It doesn't matter how much space you ask it to oscillate through, it'll still take the same amount of time to oscillate through. The, right, that's weird, right? Now, I mean, and what that must mean, if you think it through, like I must be saying, if you're following me, I'm saying even a 45, a 45 centimeter which is really like 45 to get there and then another 45 to get there and then 45 to get there and then 45 to get back. That huge swing, I'm saying it's going to take the exact same amount of time as a 15 centimeter swing, which will take the same amount of time as a two centimeter swing. That is what I'm saying. And if you're following me, then you must realize that I must be saying that this whole swing is faster on average. Like apparently the really slow swings go real, I mean, the really small swings go really slow, evidently. And the really large swings go really fast, evidently. And then you think about it, oh yeah, okay, that actually kind of does make sense because the big swings have a lot more potential energy. So therefore on average, they have a lot more kinetic energy. Okay, right, right. So I'm saying small swings are slow and big swings are fast, but by the exact perfect amount, always somehow, the compensation is perfect. Like it's not just faster if you go farther, it's perfectly faster so that no matter what, each swing is the same tick-tock rate. That's why, what is a harmonic oscillator really in the end of the day? Harmonic oscillator is fancy word for clock. This thing is a freaking clock. It keeps time irrespective of irregardless which is not a word irregardless of space like so much so i'm going to rant about this two more ways and then i'm going to look at sam's thing and then i'm going to move on but this is a big deal this is the discovery or the invention of a true clock here what is a true clock a true clock is a metronome i don't care whether it says 12 3 p.m a.m whatever military time whatever whatever a clock is something that keeps time that keeps regular rhythmic intervals of time in regardless of what's happening through it or around it. Right, right. I know it's a terrible word, yes. But I'm just trying to keep everybody's attention. Apparently I have to give me one person. Like so much so, I want to say now really clearly, like uh, in some, in some, see, this is such a big point, the police are after me. Like this is such a big point. I should literally, like Galileo first thought of this and he was put under house arrest. So that's, that's what a big point it is. Like, but seriously, it's this big of a point. You might be thinking, okay, that's very nice, Avram. Yeah, but we've been assuming like all these idealizations and optimizations of this of this system. Like you're assuming perfect Coke's law, perfect energy conservation, you're assuming no friction. So is this really, I mean, so you're not really talking about the world, you're talking about your head, yo, right? Well, yes and no. We are assuming energy conservation, we are assuming Coke's law, but check this out, check it, check it, yo, check it. I'm saying, if you really buy what I'm saying and you really see what I'm saying, I'm saying, and it doesn't matter how far the swing is, it's still gonna take the same amount of time. That means even imagine that there is friction, even imagine that this is super realistic, that this spring is, is not perfect, but has some friction. So, or it's, or it's a pendulum, Bob, if pendulums also obey this, or any other kind of, any kind of oscillator that obeys this differential equation, which certainly, as you might've found out in lab, certainly does include pendulums, right? Imagine that it's realistic so that it's damping down so that you see it actually each swing get a little bit shorter. Like it starts at 15, it starts at 15 centimeters and then it goes to like 14 and then it goes to 13. So you're like, oh, see, it's reality. The thing is, it's slowing down. So it's like not as good as, it's not really harmonic. It's not really what Gavin Brown said. Well, hold on. What you're seeing, if it's realistic, even if there is friction or whatever, what you're seeing is the amplitude decrease. Yes, that's called damping. Yes, that happens in the real world. You're seeing the amplitude decrease over each swing. Yes, the amplitude was 15, now it's 14, now it's 13. But if you're really understanding what I'm saying, or you're really like trying to hear what I'm saying, you realize that what I'm saying is the frequency and therefore the period doesn't freaking depend on amplitude. So even if the amplitude is decreasing as it does, in the realistic real world, still the TikTok rate for the most part won't. I mean, within reason, like within much bigger 
param um, boundaries of reason than you might imagine. I'm saying even a realistic clock is a clock because even as it slows down, it doesn't slow down. It just shrinks down to a point where eventually you can't see it do its thing anymore and then you like need to wind it again. But even if that's as it's shrinking in swing size, it is not shrinking in swing time. That's why it's a clock. And that's what Galileo noticed when he looked up in the Sistine Chapel and he was partly thinking about Jesus, but he was also partly looking up into the heavens and noticed, and I say that with total respect, honestly, to both parties involved, but he's looking also up at the chandeliers in the Sistine Chapel and seeing them swing in the wind. And he notices, oh my God, each time it seems like no matter what they're doing, even if they're getting shorter and shorter swings, it seems like they're always keeping time. This is when he first noticed the nature of an oscillator. And he was like, whoa, that thing is keeping time, even as it doesn't keep space. I bet I can make clocks out of it, which he eventually did. And we eventually have mechanical clocks, which we didn't before because of that. And then you could ask, well, if he didn't have clocks, how did he know that the thing was keeping time? Oh, good question. Very good question. Because he didn't have a clock. So how could he know how good of a clock this pendulum was that he eventually made clocks out of? Good question. And the answer is his heartbeat. It was that perfect? No, but it was good enough to motivate better work and better investigation and what's called successive approximations. His heart rate gave him a conjecture that tested that allowed him to test little pendulums in his lab at home that were better than that one. And he tested and tested enough to then start using those pendulums as clocks to do better and do other experiments and eventually measure the acceleration due to gravity with his clocks that he made from pendulums that he made from his heart. Was any of it perfect? No, but each thing was good enough to get to the next advanced step, conjecture and verify. It's not called strict math, it's called science. Let me look at Sam's thing in the chat. Oh, there's three things in the chat, sorry, okay. Okay, okay. Yes, so Sam's thing in the chat, is exactly my point. And by the way, I probably, even if I get to nothing else today, this is such a big point that I'm glad we're getting to it. And I'm glad at least one person understands. And anybody else who wants to chime in, even show that you do or don't understand would be really, really helpful. And not about repetitive. I mean, even if all of you said something. But anyway, Sam's point, she says, so a spring with the same mass and K, the same mass and the same stiffness will have the same angular frequency, even if you start at different displacements. Yes, that is hugely, exactly, precisely, and enormously my point. And it's true enough that the math shows it, but it's surprising enough that it's worth saying. It is the, it's kind of like the essence of what is interesting about harmonic oscillation. A harmonic oscillator is the original pure clock. So, so yes, to what Sam said, and then said, oh, okay. All right, so there's a, awesome, okay? So from now on, if I ever say harmonic, if I say oscillation, I mean, but if I say harmonic, I mean an oscillation for which the angular frequency and period is so constant that it's not just constant, how constant is it? It's so constant that it's a constant independent of conditions, independent of amplitude. A, an angular frequency that is dependent only on parameters that is independent of, so literally, angular frequency independent of amplitude, that's what harmonic means. And that's what's true for our examples from here on in. Okay, took me a little while to say that, but that's a huge point. It's Galileo's history. Now we're going to turn to homework two and just practice this sort of, um, sort of so let me, I'm going to just show you, I'm going to quickly do a screen. I'm going to change the screen for a second just to see what we're talking about. Oh, not that. This. Wait, uh, hold on. I don't, am I sharing the right thing? Probably not. One second. Probably just sharing a very embarrassing email to everybody. Uh, wait. Uh, hang on, sorry. So where is, let's ask one more time. Okay, so hopefully what you're seeing, yes. Okay, for some of you, this is just to remind, hopefully, look, if you're in the class, uh, whether you've done this or not, hopefully you have the sheet in front of you. I'm not gonna be able to keep it up the whole time, but um, this is the sheet I'm talking about. Um, and we're gonna start going through it and it'll be a little bit more concrete maybe than what I've been saying. I just want you to notice, this is now practicing, like, 
all of this looked maybe very hard or some I don't know what it looked like. But now we're just practicing what we've been saying about the math. We're, you know, this is pure math now in a way. And that's why it's called math methods. But but we're gonna go in the opposite direction. Now what we're doing now is looking at functions, direct functions that seem to have certain nice properties, like seem to have cosines in them or something like that. We're looking at functions and we're testing to see whether they are or are not solutions to, to our differential equation, to our what we're gonna to refer to from now on as our differential equation for simple harmonic oscillation. Like that's what we have. We have a differential equation that is the harmonic oscillation differential equation. And we're gonna now test different solutions. Again, this doesn't show you how to get a possible solution. We've done that once already. This just shows you if you have a certain conjecture in your mind, how to test whether it's actually true or not. So this is like a scientific way of looking at math in a way. Um, um, so you might call this reverse engineering or you might call it direct differentiation or whatever it is. Okay, we're gonna go through. So, so I'm just, I'm looking at a function. It's X equals A cosine omega T. I could have called it X equals X naught cosine omega T, but I'm trying to get used to the idea now that X naught and A, like, like initial position and amplitude position are interchangeable concepts now in this context. So I just have this mathematical function, A cosine omega T. I'm gonna ask, I'm asking myself to take two derivatives because I ultimately wanna see by taking two derivatives, whether it fits the second order differential equation that is harmonic oscillation, okay? That, so we're just like, we're just doing the same thing we did, but we're practicing. Okay, so I hope that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer these questions. I'm gonna switch the screen again. Please stop me if that's annoying or distracting. I'm gonna go back to the board and write. But if you're, if you're not in the class and you're watching this, which again, God bless you. I, I think that's bizarre, but also I mean, not bizarre. But if you're not in the class and you're watching this, like please make a note of these questions or whatever. Oh, of course, if you're in the class, whenever you do your homework, you are supposed to always show the question as clearly and explicitly before you actually answer it. And in fact, right, WIQ, what is the question? It's good for all of us to do that. So I'm going to do that in my notes. So no one has to be looking at this. Okay, I'm switching back. So this is the question, right? And again, even if you don't have the sheet in front of you, this is the question. This is all the information you need to know what we're doing. This is what we're supposed to do in our homework to me. Many of you, I graded the homework. And even if and the homework was really, really impressive, those of you who did it, but just, you just do want to make sure to even have an explicit beat where you're like, this is the, don't, before you dive in and take a derivative, make it clear. The goal here is to take a derivative and then take the derivative, if that makes sense. Maybe even change colors as I will do. Now. So we have x equals a cosine omega t. We're being asked to take the derivative with respect to t. By the way, this assume if it, if it says what's dx dt, and if it says x equals a cosine omega t, but that assumes, I mean, the, the structure of all that writing is that t is the independent variable, x is the dependent variable. Everything else I see is a constant. It's just a number that I happen not to know because it might change from experimental setup to set. But right, a and omega are just numbers. They just unspecified, right? right. Okay, so I'm gonna take so I'm gonna take the derivative. How am I gonna take
to be as clear as possible. Now, to some of you, this is totally obvious. To some of you, it's still sketchy. And you really, I'm going to do something you can really stop me. This happened last semester. If you're foggy on the chain rule or foggy why I'm using the chain rule or how, you're welcome to stop me. You shouldn't be embarrassed. You can stop me in direct chat if you want. I will admit to all of you. Well, I'm going to get the answer and then you tell me. But I know that there's some of you in the class that are going to find this answer totally obvious. And I saw it in your homework and you didn't even show any work because it was like right in your head. And I get that. But then some of you never really were comfortable with this. And it's fine either way. You just have to make it clear to me. But here's what I think. I think... I think I think the derivative of cosine is negative sine, but I don't think we just have we. In other words, the, maybe I should try this. Well, I, I think if we just had y equals cosine of x, the derivative dy dx would be negative sine of x. That that so that's what I mean by trig derivatives. Like the derivative of cosine itself is negative sine, but we don't just have cosine of a variable. We have co. We don't just have a function we have a function of a function we have cosine of omega times t so before we even take the cosine we're doing something to t we're multiplying it by a constant right it's like we have the function omega t if we have x equals omega t and maybe i should write this out maybe i will in a minute but if i just walked up to you and said y equals omega times x what's dy dx what's the derivative you would say to me omega right or if I say, here's a function y equals mx plus b, what's dy dx? What's the derivative of that? You would say m. You would say, oh, you have a straight line there. The derivative is slope. The slope is m, right? Same thing here. It happens to be a t, not an x. And it happens to be an x, not a y. But the derivative of the thing inside the parentheses, the derivative of that thing inside there is omega. And the chain rule says if you have a function of a function, then your ultimate derivative is the derivative of the outer times the derivative of the inner, right? So I'm going to write down the thing and then I'm maybe sure. So again, for some of you, that's obvious and some of you, it's not. And there's no judgment there. But let's just be honest about it, at least to ourselves. So I'm saying. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's the answer. It, maybe I, if I want to show a little work here, maybe I should at least once I'm looking at the time. But, but that's the answer to the first one. The, the derivative is d negative omega a sine of omega t. Really, it's in, put another way, it's negative a sine omega t times omega. And then I just brought the omega to the front. Um, Oh, maybe I said this to you guys last time. I'm, I think it was last semester. People in the class were honest enough to say that they were still completely mystified by the chain rule, didn't see how it applied or how, how to apply it or what. And I ended up giving like two full lectures on just that, I think. And you, you can look them up and play them if, if it's helpful. But I'll just, and I'm not going to do that here unless or until people ask, because I don't want to bore you. But I'll say one thing about the chain rule. Maybe I said this two weeks ago. Like, you know, the chain rule in English is, well, For me, it's a lot easier to picture the chain rule and a lot easier to see both sort of plausibly why it's true and how to, what to do with it if I write it out in this notation. Like what the chain rule is saying in English is if you have a function of a function, right? If y is a function of x, but then z is some function of that function of x. If you have a function embedded in a function, then the entire derivative dz dx 
the rate of change of z with respect to the inner inner variable, right? The rate of change of the outer variable with respect to the way inner is equal to the rate of change of the outer with respect to the middle times the rate of change of the middle with respect to the inner. Like if you write it out in this notation, it almost seems obvious, like the dy. Now, I'm not saying you're always allowed to do that. I'm not saying that's a proof. It's not a proof, but it just shows you why it sort of makes sense. We're just saying, take the outer derivative, multiply it by the inner derivative, and that gives you the whole derivative because dz with respect to dx should equal dz with respect to dy times dy dx, right? That's what the chain rule is, and that's what we're doing, okay? So we, got, we did the negative so sign, and we multiplied it by omega. I don't know if that helps anybody, but so that we got the answer to the first derivative. Okay, I probably should have dragged it out to two steps, but I did. And then I multiply, I, I just rearranged, I put the omega in the front, because I like, as a physicist, to have all the constants in the front variables after whenever I can. All right, so that was the first one. Okay, so now the next question it's asking what's the second derivative, right? And that just means what's the derivative of the derivative? Take the derivative of the thing we just got. So we're just going to do the same thing again. So we just said that the derivative was negative a omega sine of omega t. Okay, so if we just do the same thing again. And again, most of you who did this, I mean, I, and again, I, a lot of you haven't done it yet, and it's totally understandable, but those of you who did try, it probably look very intimidating at first. If you look at it now, it won't. And those of you who did it totally got this right. Almost anybody who did this homework, if I, I might have taken off points for formatting or not showing the question, but almost anybody who tried this did, did know what they were doing and did get it right, which I saw. But I'm just going to do it again. So the A just sits there. The negative sign sits there. Oh, I'm sorry. The derivative of sine is cosine, not negative cosine. So nothing happens to the negative sign. It just sits there. But another omega comes out, so we get omega. I'm pro I probably should. <laughs> okay. The notes I just put at the bottom, I probably should have put on the other page. I'm just reminding us, like, if, if you have y equals cosine of x, then the derivative is negative sine of x. And I'm just saying y, of x, y and x in general as math statements. But if you have y equals sine of x, the derivative is cosine of x. Like, you only get a negative sign going in one direction. So if you go twice, you don't get rid of the negative sign. It still sits there, if that makes sense. But the omega each time comes out because each time we're doing chain rule. Each time the omega comes out. So we have an omega squared now, right? So that's the answer to that one. Okay, so that's the answer to that question. Then, we have 10 minutes. Then, right. Right, okay. Now we ask. Now, there I'm just like sort of churning math. I'm practicing derivatives. I'm looking at a function. I'm seeing what happens when I differentiate it. Like, whatever. But now I'm asking the key question about that sort of shows why I'm even playing with these things. Like now in part B, in part B it says, <laughs> is this function that I'm playing with, is it a solution to this? Now, all these letters, all these x's could have been z's, or they could have been y's, or they could have been q's, as long as the, the variable in the denominator of the left-hand side is a t, as long as we're talking about t. What I'm now asking is, okay, this function that I'm playing with, and that just tested, does it satisfy the differential equation for 
simple harmonic oscillate. Right, well, I shouldn't start with the sine wave. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So I'm now asking, is that position function, like that way of predicting where something is in time, does it satisfy what I know to be the differential equation for harmonic oscillation? In other words, the math way of writing Hooke's law. Now look, if you've been paying attention to everything we've been doing, and if you were paying attention, and I don't mean like, if I were paying attention to last uh, Thursday, I, I know that the answer is yes, because that's what we've been trying to say for two days. I mean, we do know from two days ago, the answer is yes. Right now we're trying to reinforce that or see again why, what we mean by that. And frankly, what we're also trying to do is set up a contrast here. Like we're gonna try some other solutions in a minute and see that they don't satisfy. So that this, so I want you to see that this is a meaningful thing when we say something satisfies or is a solution to a differential equation. It, not everything is, not every function that looks the same, similar is a solution. Some are and some aren't. We're trying to see the meaning of that by contrasting yeses to no's. So here, so I'm gonna do it fresh. Like, does this satisfy this? The answer is, well, the answer is yes, but why? Well, evidently, we just said, We just found, right, we just found that the second derivative with respect to time is equal to negative a omega squared cosine omega t. That in itself doesn't literally tell me anything. I mean, it looks good if I have experience, but it, it just, it's just a statement. But if I remember that this Right, the point is, like multiplication is commutative, so I was able to move the omega squared out. The point is, oh, when I took the second derivative, I got back my original x. When I took the, like, I, I had a cosine omega t, I took a derivative, and then I got negative a sine omega t. But then I took a derivative again, and I got the cosine back. So taking one derivative was not good enough. But taking two derivatives, when I took two time derivatives, I got back my original x. I got back a cosine omega t, and it was multiplied by omega squared and multiplied by a negative sign. That's what the differential equation is saying was supposed to happen. I'm not saying that always happens. I'm saying that happens when x equals a cosine omega t. Like when we choose cosine and you take two time derivatives of it, you get back itself times this constant that happens to be called omega squared times a negative. So yes, in this case, yeah, what we do, because we got, so the answer is yes. Okay, that's the answer to that one. We have exactly five minutes more. It's perfect timing for me just to do one more example and show, I like again, nothing ever makes any sense to me. Like if someone says, this is a thing, this is this, I don't understand it until they also show me, and this is not this. Like I, right? I mean, if, if every, this makes more sense to me, at least if I contrast it, if I look at a case where something might look like it works, but it doesn't work. So that's what we have next. Uh, and this is the last thing we'll do, of course. The next one is, Right, and now it just jumps to, literally in C, it says, and this, again, this is the last thing we're gonna do, and we'll do it in this form. C is y equals, oh, I forgot it. Y you get, get it I'm sorry, is x, I'm sorry. Is x equals um, a cosine five t. So we got a cosine function here, we got like an a in it, we got like a number before the t, like that looks good, right? Like it looks like a, like what we're talking, it looks like an oscillator. In fact, it is an oscillator. Question is, is that a solution uh, to that? Now look, that, it, that is a cosine thing. And the d2x dt squared 
is an example of simple harm. Like that is the differential equation for a simple harmonic oscillation, right? Like that negative, it's got d2x d2 squared equals negative some number times x. That totally is the format, the form of oscillation. So this looks reasonable. We're asking, is that top thing a solution to that bottom thing? Well, how do I find out what's a procedure? Well, I just learned the procedure in part A. I'm just going to do it fast. Like I don't, the question is assuming now that I get what's going on, that what I have to do is take two derivatives and see. I've got four minutes. So I'm going to take two derivatives and see. <laughs> And why two? Because the differential equation has a second derivative on the left side of the second order. So dx dt equals negative 5a sine, right? Chain rule, the 5 comes out. And dx. So we're, we're just sort of seeing what if 5 is the example. It just has an example. What if 5 happens to be what we mean by omega or whatever. So now we do it again. So we get negative 25a cosine 5t. Okay, so that's d2x dt is equal to negative 25a cosine 5t. And the question is, does negative a cosine 5t equal negative 3a cosine, ah, sorry. Got two minutes to write this stuff. I'm just, I'm not changing, I'm just moving it over. The question here is does negative 25a cosine 5t equal negative 3a cosine 5t? And where did I get negative 3a cosine t? Because the differential equation I'm trying to satisfy is right here. It says the question is does it satisfy d2x dt squared equals negative 3x? X is a cosine 5t, so I put a 3. The, so the question is, does 1 satisfy the other? And the answer is no, it totally doesn't. Like the answer to this question, and this is where we're stopping, but the answer to this one is even though it all looked good, even though it had SHO and it had a cosine, the answer is no. Negative 25 does not equal, or well, well 25 does not equal 3. What does that mean in English? It means that we have an oscillator here, sure. Like x equals uh, a cosine five t is an oscillator. It's an oscillator that's going back and forth, back and forth at five radians per second. But that's not the oscillator that the differential equation is asking about. The differential equation is asking about one particular oscillator with an angular frequency of, of, of square root of three. And this one has an angular uh, oscillator of, um, yeah. And this, this one has an angular frequency of five. So they are both oscillators, but they're not the same oscillator. This solution would not work to predict the motion of that Hooke's law. That's it. That is class. So we've gotten some, we'll keep going with. But again, now maybe you're seeing it. Maybe you could try homework two now or move on to homework three even. You actually, believe it or not, do know enough to do homework three, believe it or not. But okay, I'm done. Thank you for so much patience. I'm going to um, stop. But if there's any questions, I'm here to answer them. I'm going to turn off. But goodbye, goodbye, and thank you, thank you. And I'm going to turn off the recording. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Luna. Okay. Yes, have a nice day, you, Jenna. Thank you. Okay, awesome, great, awesome. Thank you. Bye, Jennifer. Thank you. And you guys are copying down the notes. I'm thinking maybe Nikaya and you you're copying. Just tell me when. Nikaya and you, should I, are you, just have to, or you're there, right? You're copying down the notes or? Wait, are you, wait, Nikaya or Yoon, are you, is either one of you there?
If so, take your time. I'm fine, but if not, I'm going to leave. Nikaya or you. Oh, I didn't stop recording. Sorry.